put you first. I didn't want to go through this. Because <laughs> I was first last year. All right, let's see. It is working. Okay, so this is actually a talk that I wanted to give for a couple of years. Um, and I was going to give it this time last year, but as some of you know, I was waylaid by a pit viper in Costa Rica. Um, so I, I, I was in bed when, when I should have been giving this talk. Um, but basically, a couple of years ago, so I, you know, I've been in the sort of the integrative, functional, ancestral health kind of space for five or six years now. And I, and I went to an event a couple of years ago, and this very well-respected physician stood up, you know, probably thought to be one of the, the thought leaders in, in using genetics in health, stood up and said, I'm a low-carb genotype, but my partner is a low-fat genotype. And I was like, what? <laughs> is that a thing? Like, do, do, we, do we know that? Um, and I, I kind of thought that I would have heard about it before then, but, you know, I was willing to, to you know, be wrong and, and learn some more. So then over the last... So a couple of years, I, I thought, well, what do I want to learn here? Um, I want to know, you know, if this is going to be useful, you know, genetics and, and, and personalizing lifestyle um, or medicine. Um, how do common genotypes, common single nucleotide polymorphism SNPs that you'll get from like a 23andMe test, how do they alter the phenotype, which is what we care about, essentially the thing that we can measure in our, in our patients? And importantly, what's the variability in what we call penetrance? What's the variability in how that SNP actually affects that phenotype? And then what evidence do we have for a given intervention based on a given genotype? That's, that's something that's very important and something that I wanted to find out. So um, this whole thing makes me think about, made me think about this, uh, this uh, quote, which Mark Twain attributes to Benjamin Disraeli, who's a former prime minister of, the, of Great Britain, that there are three kinds of lies, lies, damned lies, and statistics. And this is something that is used gen generally to uh, make, you know, for, for people to make you think that your genetics have a certain effect on your outcome, your disease, uh, your disease state. And when you look at Wikipedia, um, they say that, you know, Based on this quote is a phrase describing the persuasive power of numbers, particularly the use of statistics to bolster weak arguments. And I think that's really what we're seeing a lot of in the functional medicine space. Um, but the caveat is, and I said that last time, is that I'm about to make my case using <laughs> statistics. So, so uh, you can make of that what you will. Um, here we go. So when we talk about genetics, we're often talking about statistics. So Throughout the talk, you'll see a little bit of my own genotype, my own 23andMe, and I sort of when I put it in some calculators, put it into some nutrigenomics tools to see what it said about my genotypes and, and, and the references, the papers that come out of that. So I am one of a fairly common group of people who have a very significant decrease in function of my MTHFR uh, gene, my methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase. We'll talk about that more later. Apparently, I have more than a 50% loss in function. And that means that I need more than twice the amount of choline every day. That's what I'm told. Um, I also have um, an increased function of my COMT gene. That means that I process dopamine more quickly. That means that I have a lower IQ and worse executive function. Um, <laughs> and, and so uh, my risk of diabetes based on one SNP and the melatonin receptor 1B might increase my type of diabetes risk is increased by 67%. Right, that's a lot. I mean, I should, I mean, I had pineapple for breakfast. Just think about <laughs> what, what it's doing to my blood sugar. Um, so how much do these statements really apply? That's what we want to know. So some notes. Um, I'm only going to be fo focusing on single nucleotide polymorphisms that you might measure on a 23andMe, so not uncommon genes, recessive disorders with a high penetrance like uh, cystic fibrosis. Um, I, like I said, used a couple of genomics tools, used my own genes, and then applied a lot of statistical trickery that I hopefully will help you understand early on in the talk. Cool. So just like super high level, what do these things do? Single nucleotide poly polymorphisms are spots in your DNA where you have a change in one of your nucleotides, so say from an A to a G or a T, and then this changes the gene function somehow, changes the protein function somehow, and then this causes variable disease risk. This is, this is what everybody is, is interested in. So importantly, when we're looking at studies of 
genetic polymorphisms and outcomes, we make a number of assumptions. And that, those assumptions are made so that it's easy to analyze the data, but it also means that it's easier for us to do some, some detective work. So we assume that the data follows a normal distribution, like a normal standard bell curve. So for any person with any given uh, genetic um, mixture, their phenotype will fall, fall somewhere on a bell curve that we can describe. Um, and then if you have multiple SNPs that affect a certain disease type or a certain phenotype, they are in some way additive or linear. So even if a certain SNP has a smaller effect, you can add them on top of each other to give some kind of overall risk score. And that is, that is frequently done. Um, so, come on, there we go. So, so just like a brief review of, um, of, of what that looks like, here is a normal bell curve. Uh, we describe it as the mean, so that's the, the point in the middle here, the highest point, that's the, the standard average, with some kind of standard deviation that, that tells you something about the population. So one standard deviation on either side is about 68% of people, two standard deviations either side is roughly 95% of people. So if we take a group, we can, we can calculate their average, we can calculate the standard deviation, and then we know what this bell curve should look like. So just as an, uh, an example of, of how this is used, um, and this is where a lot of the problems come when we're looking at uh, uh, scientific research, is that rather than giving the standard deviation, often we use something called the standard error of the mean, which we can calculate if we know the number of people in the bell curve and all the other metrics. So just to show you how this works, I've plotted some data. This is data on fasting blood glucose in women from NHANES, which is the big uh, population study in the US. And here's their age and here's their average fasting blood glucose and you can see these error bars that's the standard error of the mean and you see okay so if you're in you know sort of 18 early 20s you're somewhere around 85 and then that slowly increases to your about you know in your 60s and then it stays fairly level you look at that you think that's fairly compelling data you know the the blood sugar increases steadily over those decades and then sort of levels off a bit um if we plotted this with a standard deviation this is what it looks like so this is now covering 68% of people. And you see it's much, much wider. There's a huge amount of variability there. So the average is the same, but these error bars tell you that actually, you know, there's a bit of overlap in terms of what happens in each group. And that doesn't even tell the full story. So when I show you graphs, there they go. The reason why we do this in, in scientific research is because it makes your graph look nicer. That's pretty much the only reason why you do it. Um, but it really doesn't help us if we're trying to understand the data. So I plot something called violin plots. Um, and what these look like is basically they give you an idea of the whole bell curve, plus tell you something about, so you have like the average here and then like the quartiles either side. And so this is that same data and you can see across the ages, yes, it does slowly increase at, um, over age, your average blood glucose, but there's huge variability and these tails tell you that and actually, these were, because it's obviously, it's the US, these went up to like four, 500 milligrams deciliter for some, but I, I just cut that off because the, the graph looks ridiculous. Uh, but this, I'll, I'll use graphs like this so you can really start to see the overlap of the data because the variability in people is what, what we're really interested in understanding. So if we know, if it, in a paper, they'll usually give you the mean of a population and they'll give you the standard deviation or the standard error of the mean or the 95% confidence interval. And if we know those things, then we can recreate the bell curve and start to look at it. And so that's what I've done for all these different genes that we're gonna talk about. And it's really easy to do. So you can use a random number generator to generate a synthetic data set. And I've used a thousand people each time just so we give a good number to do some statistics on. And uh, most of the data that I've shown you was, was randomly generated by uh, in Python, not by me because I don't understand Python, by a friend of mine, Nathan. Uh, but you can actually, there are, there are free online tools you can do to do this. Um, and, and try this. And then where possible, I grab data that was comparable to me um, because I think that's really important. And luckily for me, uh, the tyranny of the white middle-class male means that there's lots of data for me to compare myself to. Unfortunately for our patients, that means that there are a lot of people where there just isn't that much description in, in the, the medical literature. Just like everybody. Yeah, exactly. Everybody should be like me. Um, so this is just, this is just um, an example of, of, of how we might use this. So if we have two normal distributions, we can calculate how much they overlap. And that tells you something about whether a gene is likely to have an effect or not. So this is just example data from a Norwegian cohort 
Um, age of onset of late uh, onset Alzheimer's disease in those who are APOE44 or anything else. And so the paper gave a mean, a standard deviation, I plotted the bell curves. And what we want to know is who's going to be affected by this genotype? Um, who's going to be affected by the E44? And that's this group where there isn't an overlap for the other. So these guys here where there's an overlap, they have essentially the same potential risk of onset as those who don't have. E44. So these are the people we're interested in. We're interested in how much do these do the, do, do the curves overlap? What's the percentage chance that this has an effect? And, e, and ApoE4 is the best possible example to use because it's pretty much the, the only SNP that really gives you a meaningful uh, increase in risk of, of, of your phenotype. Um, I just gave you the end of the story. But yes. <laughs> <laughs> so as an example, um, obviously, we live in a population that has a uh, uh, very high risk of being overweight or obese. And so people are very interested in the fat mass and obesity associated protein or FTO gene. And if you look at big meta-analyses of this gene, they tell you that per A, so what you get is, um, an A replacing a T in this gene, and per A copy, you can have up to two, your average BMI increases by 0.3. And you think, okay, you know, that's a reasonable amount. I have two copies, my BMI goes up by more than 0.5. You know, what does this you know, really mean for me? And, you know, every time it's talked about, you, know, you assume that this will happen to you. Like, you have this gene, this is going to happen to you. So just to, to um, give an example of, of how this works, um, this is uh, data from the Northern Finland Birth Cohort. These are people in their 30s of um, uh, Finnish origin uh, or, or Scandinavian origin. And if we plot what their BMIs are based on their genotype, this is what we see. So yes, the average in the middle here does like increase a little bit, but there's a huge amount of overlap between the two groups. And so up here, I've calculated what I call the likelihood of null effect. So that's like how much overlap is there between the distributions? What percentage chance is there that this gene is going to be affecting a person? And so if you're AT, like me, so I'm in the middle here, I have a 3% chance risk a 3% chance of my genotype affecting my BMI. Because the rest of the, there's a 97% overlap with the, with, with, with the TT. These are the baseline, these are the skinny people down here. Um, and if you have the worst version, two copies, there's still only a 7% chance that your genotype is gonna affect your body weight. So rather than it saying, this is, go, this is going to increase your BMI, which is what your nutrigenomics tool is gonna to tell you, actually the, the likelihood of it affecting you is, is very, very small. And then, you know, importantly, even the best genotype, you know, the best, uh, you know, the, the healthiest, skinniest people in this population, 41% of them are still overweight. So as we go through, it's really important to think about what is the population in which this is being studied? Is that relevant to me? Um, and so these guys, you know, and on average in most countries, we're sick to some extent, and that, that definitely skews the data. So... What we can then do is those uh, numbers that I generated, I, make, I can then run a regression, where, which is a, a statistical way of just looking at what's the linear effect of, of these genes adding onto each other. Um, and basically, the number of copies that you have of this gene explains about 0.2% of your BMI, which is like whether I drank this water before I weighed myself or not. It's basically, you know, it's just the statistical error. It, it, it's, yeah. FTO genes that get like listed and found in fitness yeah. So are you picking one of them? Yeah, so I'm picking, yeah, so there's one that's most associated with BMI, and that's the one that I'm talking about. There is a second one that has a, a smaller effect. Um, yeah, yeah, and then the other ones, and like the, the other ones haven't really been studied that well. So this is just the, this is the main one if you look at the one that they're talking about. Um, and so those have an even smaller effect that is even worth, worth worrying about even less. Um, so this is just one gene and what we're starting to do or they're starting to do is look at polygenic risk scores or polygenic hazard scores. So where we take multiple genes, multiple SNPs that are associated with a certain outcome and then we look at how their effects stack on top of each other. So this is a nice paper um, where they looked at the eight SNPs most associated with obesity. They applied it to the Epic no Norfolk cohort in the UK. And you see here, it's sort of like they created a score based on the SNPs that people had and how many copies they had and like the effect that each SNP has. Um, and then the uh, histogram is how many people are in that group. 
And then here is the mean with the with the 95% confidence interval of their average uh, BMI, which you see on, on the right hand side here. So definitely, as um, your risk goes up, your BMI certainly goes up. But one of the most important things to remember, and it's the same for everything, is that like most people just have like this standard average risk somewhere in the middle. So yes, it's interesting to think about these people down here and these people down here. But for most people, you know, it, it kind of everybody has average risk on, on average. So if we then do a similar thing, um, I plotted all the data using those distributions. Um, and you can see like if you go from the lowest score to the highest score, the average BMI does increase by a reasonable amount, 1.4, and the risk of obesity increases by about 13%. Um, but you also see there's a huge amount of variability. So even if you have like this worst possible genetic um, risk, like there's still a good good chunk, like 30% of people down here who are a normal weight, which is which is what we'd expect. Um, and importantly, again, even in the best genetic group uh, in these Brits, God help us, more than 20, like more than 50% are overweight, even in the best genetic group. So that baseline, everybody's overweight to begin with, and that's the that's the group that we're looking at. So again, I do this uh, statistical regression. Um, and you sort of, again, you see this line it goes up as your genetic score goes up uh, with your simulated BMI. But even using this only explains about 2% of your overall BMI using the eight most, um, you know, the eight most impressive, important SNPs to do with your, your, your obesity. And then you're thinking, Tommy, man, there's six FTO SNPs alone. Like there are dozens of genes which affect, um, which affect uh, your weight. And then each one has dozens of SNPs. You know, just looking at eight, that's not important. So, so this, you know, we need more SNPs. Um, and this is a paper um, that has 141 SNPs analyzed in 120,000 people. So now we're talking, right? And here you see again, like this, 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 this great line is your, they, so they split people into deciles this time. So each one is 10% of their, of their risk score. And this is their average BMI. So like from 25 up to 30, like that's a big deal. Um, and you think, that's a really nice linear effect. Like, look at that. And then you say, well, hang on a second. Where are my error bars? Where's the description of the variability? Um, and this is published in Cell, which is a super important journal. So like, if I was a reviewer, I'd be like, you can't do that. I'm surprised they even published this. And so I couldn't do my analysis on this data because they didn't give us a description of the variability in the population. But they did say, so compared to 2% in the last one, this still only protect, uh, predicts 13% of your BMI. That means that 87% of your BMI is driven by the environment, right? So even with 141 SNPs, like how much does this even really matter? You know, I'm, I'm really not convinced. Um, and again, the average BMI in this group is 27. So these people are, are in an environment, in an obesogenic environment, they are overweight because of it. And then there's some genetic effect on top of that. But you know, it's it's still almost entirely driven by the environment. So this is a nice paper um, where they looked at the FTO genotype. So again, this is the one that has the biggest effect. And they looked at people before and after the Second World War. And so, you know, these are our skinny people down here. Here's me, here's, you know, here's the, the fatties with, with double A. Um, and you see that purple um, is after World War II, blue is before. And so this is age and BMI. And so in this genotype, it doesn't really have an effect, but in the AT and the AA, only in the post-war group did uh, the FTO genotype associate with, with increased risk of BMI. So again, a, a lot of evidence suggests that it's driven by the environment. So if you're worried about your genetic obesity risk, don't eat like the average post-war American. Um, you should move occasionally um, when uh, they look at the effect of activity on risk of obesity due to, um, due to various SNPs. Almost all of that risk disappears in people who are just doing any kind of activity for one hour a day, right? So it's not like you have to go to the gym or, or work really hard. Just like being at a standing desk for an hour a day counts. Like it's that little activity. And I, I think everybody in here would agree that that's important. And, you know, that's the, the advice is the same regardless of your genetics. But even if you just do like the basics, all of a sudden those, those, those uh, SNPs don't matter at all. Well, they matter even less. So I did something similar for risk of uh, type 2 diabetes. Uh, this is, uh, again, here we have a glucose uh, genetic risk score using the Framium cohort in the US this time. Here's fasting glucose. Here's our predicted numbers. And I've sort of plotted the full thing. 
Um, and uh, this line in the middle here, this is 90 milligrams per deciliter, which we would probably agree is the line that you want to try and be below if you want to minimize your risk of chronic disease. Um, and so if you compare us to various hunter-gatherer populations, I've plotted the two percentins and the catavans. They have a 3% and a 1% risk, uh, respectively, of just even having blood glucose above 90. So like, it's almost unheard of in them. Whereas in the framium cohort, even the best genetic guys, you know, more than 50%, 61% are above 90 milligrams of deciliter. So this is all driven by the environment that we're, we're existing in. And we know that, we know these guys, if we put them in, you know, they'll get just as diabetic as the rest of us. They're not like superhuman, they're immune to, to type 2 diabetes. Um, and this is, uh, so just to kind of, this is a table of all that data, you know, I don't say, don't expect you to look at it, but so again, uh, this is the best genetic score here. Average blood glucose is 92.5, but even in the worst, you know, the guys who are, you know, so their average um, glucose does increase by six, but still like 72% overlap in the blood glucose. So like 70 to 80% um, of people, even, you know, in the worst genetic groups, that it's not driven by the genes at all. You know, there's maybe 20 to 30% which will, where it will have an effect, but the majority of people, it won't have an effect. And again, this is in people who are baseline, essentially uh, pre-diabetic. So when I uh, run the same analysis, uh, we see in these 16 SNPs most significantly associated with type 2 diabetes, your genetic score determines about 5% of your blood glucose level, your fasting blood glucose. And, and that is um, smaller than the error you see in the average handheld glucometer. So the, the error, so your genes, you couldn't even detect the effect in a handheld glucometer that you would use to track type 2 diabetes or you know, if you're fasting or, or any of those effects because the error um, is greater than the effect of your genes. Right, that's, that's, that's how much you need to worry about that. So, I mean, this is where, again, we come back to the fact like who is, who is the comparison group? So uh, there's a nice paper that came out a couple of years ago that looked at the prevalence of what they called optimal metabolic health in the US, again, using NHANES. And their cutoffs weren't great. So they used 100 milligrams per deciliter for blood glucose, 150 milligrams per deciliter for, for um, triglycerides. So we could probably all agree that those could be tightened up. So, but even using that, 82.4% of Americans did not have optimal metabolic health. So again, on average, we are sick. 11% uh, of adults have type 2 diabetes. Um, that increases to 20% in the above 65s. You compare that to less than 1% in hunter-gatherers. So here is a paper from the Bolivian semen A. Here you look at uh, blood glucose over seven. So this is type 2 diabetes. On average, they have a 0% risk of type 2 diabetes. And so if I'm worried about my MTN R1B SNP, which increases my risk of diabetes by 67%, 67% of 0% is still 0%, zero right? So if, if, um, if, if you're in an environment that isn't driving type 2 diabetes, pre-diabetes, then it doesn't matter what your genetic risk associated with that is. So next, MTHFR, um, which is probably the most talked about um, set of SNPs. Um, and what's really nice about it is that there are two common SNPs, there are more than that, but there are two common SNPs that have been studied and they've been studied in combination and they have additive effects on the function of the gene. And then you can look at some kind of phenotype that you might care about. So like I said, I am homozygous for both, which, put, sorry, I am heterozygous for both. If I was homozygous for both, I'd be in real trouble. Um, yeah, uh, that, I think like it has been seen, but very, very rarely. So I'm heterozygous for both. Thanks for catching that. Um, and so you can, see, you can see that here. So this is when you sort of measure the activity in a test tube, but this is probably what you care about. So you have the 1298 uh, AA, or you can add a C, two Cs, and the 677CC, CT, CT, TT. And then this is the amount of loss of function you get in combination. So this is me here. Um, this is the best. These are the only people who are considered to have any good MTHFR function. This is less than 15% of the population, maybe 12%. Um, so like, I mean, this sounds bad, right? I sh should I worry about that? And so if I plot the activity of, of, of the protein on average, um, here, these are the best guys. Uh, and then you see, I've sort of plotted them in order of loss of function. And this is me down here. 
Um, and this, is, this, this line is the average uh, of the wild type here, the, the, the good guys. So I have a 100% chance of having activity that's below the average of the good group. And like, that sounds pretty bad. Like, there's, I can't even like statistically manipulate myself out of that. Like, how, how, how much? So then like, so I'm 100% guaranteed to have worse function. Uh, but what does that mean? Um, so one way, oh, and then it's also worth, so these 677 TTs, they're even worse off. Like they're terrible function of the gene, but we have to look at them separately because the data doesn't quite look the same. Um, and so they'll come, they'll come later. But one way that we look at the system and it's obviously not perfect because there's multiple ways that, it, that, that, that things can happen. Uh, but you have homocysteine down here um, and the MTHFR gene here is required to, um, to, to create 5-methylene tetrahydrofolate to then clear or recycle homocysteine. So if you have poor MTHFR function, homocysteine is expected to increase. And obviously lots of nutrients required throughout this system, um, but that's one way that we might test like, whether, whether the effect of a SNP is, you know, is affecting our phenotype. So using that same paper, um, where they measured the function of the genes and in combination, I plotted um, predicted homocysteine. Um, and I put a line here at homocysteine of 10. It's debated as to whether this is the cutoff that we need to worry about, uh, the level of homocysteine. Um, but it's, it's maybe somewhere in that region, 10 to 12. And, and you can see that on average, even the best guys, like 83% have a homocysteine above 10. And again, there's huge overlap uh, across the groups. And so, um, my risk of having a homocysteine above 10 is only increased by 10% by my 52% of loss of, of, of my genetic function. Um, and then if I plot the data and do a regression, um, oh wait, no, I was gonna do this first. So if you're looking at genes versus the environment, the, the relative effect of the environment is so much greater than the genetics. Uh, like that's that's sort of how you might look at it. And then if you do, uh, then you and so again we have to remember we have to remember the comparison who group, group who are we looking at? Uh, this is the paper that everybody cites, you know, but everybody has elevated homocysteine on average. Um, and so when you plot the regression, this is percent MTHFR activity. These are the good guys up here. Um, where am I? I'm like here. Um, there, no, I'm down here. Um, and then this is homocysteine. You see that your MTHFR genotype explains 1% of the variability in your homocysteine. It's like, that's less than a lab error of measuring homocysteine. It has almost no effect overall on average. And this, these are the genotypes that cover about 80%, 85% of people. So then if we bring in these 677TT guys, um, this is data that I tried to plot using the mean and standard deviation of um, homocysteine in that paper. And it looks like a complete, it's a completely different shape, right? It doesn't seem to follow a normal bell curve. And that's because with the data that they gave us, my random number generator wanted to generate negative numbers to fill the, the normal distribution, which obviously isn't possible. So what that tells you is that data is not normally distributed and you cannot treat it in the way that everybody does. So there's huge variability here, including people who have perfectly normal homocysteine, but also people who have very high homocysteine, but it doesn't follow the normal pattern and you can't then use that to tell people something about how their MTHFR affects their homocysteine or their, their methylation function. So like I said, there's something different about these guys. If I then plug them into the same thing, if it works. So I add them here now to that regression. All of a sudden, we get a dramatic increase in how much um, MTHFR affects homocysteine, now it's 13%, but we basically added in this completely anomalous data set to do that. So using this as part of the data to tell people something about MTHFR, basically you can't do that. You're completely skewing the data and you're giving them a, a, you know, a completely backwards idea of what's really going on. And so this brings me to this question of how much choline do I need every day? So choline is a really important source of methyl groups. We're told that uh, so I was told in this online calculator that I have a 53% decrease in MTHFR, 65% decrease in activity uh, because of some other SNPs I have. And so I need more than a gram of choline every day, uh, which is eight egg yolks, more than a pound of liver, uh, more than two pounds of salmon. And, you know, like that's quite a lot. And, you know, I'm, I'm a reasonably big guy, but that's a lot of choline. Um, and like, is that actually something reasonable for me? Because if I was 6, 7 TT, it'd be even more. 
right? I'd have to eat 12 eggs, eggs a day just to like maintain normal methylation function. Um, and so what was done here is that, and this is from that tool, based on homozygotes for 677TT, a 75% loss in methylfolate production doubles codeine requirement. And so what they did is they took the normal codeine requirement here, about 550 a day, and then they said, okay, these, these people here need a, a lot more, and then we'll just plot your, method, your MTHFR function, and then we'll just pick where you are on that line, and we'll tell you that's, that's how much codeine you need. So it assumes a linear effect of this gene, and I've already shown you that doesn't exist. Um, so this is just like complete statistical nonsense. I mean, they just have no idea what they're doing. Um, and this data skews everything. And interestingly, when you then look at the, the, the references they give you, so study calculating coding requirements in 677TT, so that elevated requirement, it was in 13 folate deficient Mexican-American men. Um, and we know that ethnicity has a huge effect on uh, the penetrance of genes. And interestingly, that study didn't even show that high dose choline improved methylation in those guys. So using a completely irrelevant study where, which didn't even show what they said it, um, it, they showed, they, they're, they're then giving you recommendations on what you should eat. I mean, this is the kind of nonsense that really is sort of penetrated uh, into, into sort of the nutrigenomics world. So, right, yeah, I'm out. Right, this is just, this is crazy. So, you know, I, I did still wonder, you know, the six, seven TTs, like those guys, there's definitely something different. Is that a, a SNP, a, a, a genotype I should worry about? And it's really interesting that you only ever see um, elevated homocysteine in those guys in like really significant um, uh, nutrient deficiencies. So if they're not fo uh, folate or B12 um, uh, uh, sufficient, then you start to see these big effects. Um, and then also riboflavin um, overcomes most of that mutation because the mutation affects how uh, MTHFR binds to the FA FADH, FADH, which is uh, developed, um, made from riboflavin. So two grams of riboflavin in those guys decreases homocysteine by 20%. It's like a tiny, tiny amount. You'll get more in any, in any basic B vitamin. So like just really, really basic supplementation of B vitamins is gonna overcome any problem that you have. Two grams? Two, two milligrams. Yeah, so tight, yeah, so, and, and most uh, like good multis might have 10 or 12, so it's more, and you just pee out the extra. So um, if you're worried about MTHFR, I think you need to measure phenotype. You need to measure homocysteine, folate, B12, B6, uh, take some bioflavin, uh, eat nutrient-dense animal foods, but all of those are gonna be necessary regardless of genetics. I'm not gonna tell you to not eat those things because you do or don't have MTHFR. And then, you know, you can hack this stuff a little bit if you need to supplement glycine, creatine, a bit of riboflavin. All of this is super low risk, super high benefit, requires zero, um, uh, zero knowledge of your genetics. So next, um, this is the warrior gene. Some of you may have heard of. This is a, a full amino acid substitution in a protein in the COMT gene, which um, metabolizes dopamine. So like I said earlier, I'm a warrior. I have higher COMT. Um, uh, function. So that means I have lower dopamine in my prefrontal cortex. Um, this is me. Um, I have lower IQ, lower executive function, uh, but I may be good in a fight. This is what uh, the, all the online tools tell me. So like, how much does that, does that you know, really affect me? How much, does that, um, how much do I worry about this? So when, when we look at the study, where they talk about the activity of the gene, these are the results. Um, so they took uh, COMT activity, they took it from post-mortem brain samples of humans. Um, and then they measured the activity of the, they measured the genotype and the activity of the gene. And so here's me, I have a 38% increase in activity, you know, and here's the, the warrior type, and then here are the normal people in the middle. Um, the really interesting thing is they don't tell you what the error bars are. So you have no idea about the variability of the data. So I've had to kind of guesstimate, and this is what and so I've plotted here, this is COMT activity predicted uh, from the random number generator and the genotype. So here's me, uh, no, sorry, I've switched around. Here's me up here. And I have basically 100% chance of having higher activity than the average of the guys down here, right? That's, that seems significant to me. However, uh, this is if the error bar is a standard deviation, but the error bar is probably a standard error of the mean. Um, and so what you see here again, uh, my random number generator uh, if I assume that, once negative values, and there's huge variability and huge overlap. And what this tells you is that the data isn't normally distributed. 
Um, and there was huge variability in the data. So like everything that people then use for the next 15 years on about COMT is, is based on completely flawed, um, flawed reasoning. And uh, you know, if you think about post-mortem samples, they're taken at different times, the, the, they, they break down at different rates. It's really hard to do that kind of study. So of course the data is gonna be super variable, but what we focus on is this 38%, and then we think that that actually means something. Um, but you probably don't care about enzyme function, you probably care about like cognitive function, like how that affects you. So um, the one paper which looked at these genotypes in a good number of people, um, the one where there did seem to be an effect of, of this SNP was in the letter number score where you give people a random assortment of letters and numbers and then, you, then they have to give it back to you in numerical and alphabetical order. Um, and you see that your CMT genotype explains about 4% of your performance in that test. So again, you know, the other 96% is probably the stuff that we should be thinking about. Um, and when we, and then, so then this is, and that's, you know, all the normal stuff, movement, sleep, stress, uh, nutrient status, much more important than your genotype. Um, and so this is where I think it's important to just like quickly remember what a gene does. Um, so in this example, we assume the COMT gene makes the COMT enzyme and then it breaks down dopamine. Um, but um, to make the COMT gene, we need transcription factors which affect the activity of the gene. That's driven by the environment, both inside and outside the cell. Uh, to make dopamine, you need some tyrosine, you need some amino acids, you need these uh, vitamins, B6, copper, vitamin C, um, through various steps. And then um, you also need your methylation cycle to be working. So that's affected by the environment and nutrient status. And then also, uh, some of these genes are regulated by the circadian rhythm. So are you being exposed to light and dark at the right time? So like all of that determines how much dopamine is, your, is in your brain. And this tiny bit of enzyme function, you know, is, is, is much less important because if you have a certain amount of dopamine, it hits a dopamine receptor, you get a dopamine signal, that affects the transcription factors. So maybe my gene is less active, but my body makes more of the, more of the gene, more of the protein because it's less active and it makes no, or makes less of it because it's more active it makes no difference overall in the amount of dopamine that's in my brain. So it's important to remember that environment and feedback loops determine the result of a gene action and analyzing sort of enzyme function in isolation like that is, is basically a completely useless, a complete waste of time. Um, so <laughs> there we go. Worried about cognitive function, scaling rhythms, move, eat real food, reduce stress. So for me, that's stop worrying about being a warrior. I think that's, that's important. <laughs> that, that was my main outcome from, from, from doing that. So, um, this really interesting quote sort of spoke to me. This comes from Robert Sapolsky's book, Behave, which is excellent. Everybody should, should read it if they're interested in a really dense read, but it's, it's very good. But, and he says that having the warrior gene probably has less of an effect on your behavior than, than does believing that you have it. So thinking that you have it, thinking that it has an effect on you is gonna have a bigger effect than having the gene itself. And there's some really great data to support that this happens. So this study, uh, came out last year, they took people and they put them on a treadmill test. So they, so they saw um, how far they ran in a specific amount of time. And then they did, they uh, looked at their genes and then they told them either you have the gene that makes you good at running or you have the gene that makes you suck at running. But they told them that at random. And then they tested them again. And people who were told that they suck at running because of their genes got worse the next time they did the test. People who were told that they didn't suck at running did exactly the same. So even like regardless of genotype, thinking that you're bad at something because of your genes will then make you perform, perform worse at that. Um, and then like this effect directly affects hormonal physiology as well. So in the same study, they told people, so this is the FTO gene again. They either told people that you have the, the risk gene um, or you have the protected gene. And this is actually the one example I could find where being told something good about your genes had a positive effect. Um, and then they gave them a test meal. And this is looking at GLP-1, so there's uh, uh, an increase in, in the gut. And being told that you have a protective gene type actually increased the release of that hormone. So just thinking, you know, regardless of your actual gene type, thinking you have a protective gene type, increased GLP-1, and then that increased your society after a test meal. Just thinking that you had a different gene type, right? So the effect of what you think your gene type is is more important than the gene itself, right? This is super, super interesting. Um, and then, so if we come back quickly to the, the fat versus carb thing, um, everything that exists in the literature is like, 
this awful mass up of nutritional epidemiology plus genome-wide association studies. So you basically have like crap times crap, which gives you more crap squared. Um, and like there's no intervention trial that says people with this genotype do better on this diet. It just hasn't been done. Anytime it's been tried, it didn't show any difference. Um, so this is the closest that we have. This is uh, Chris Gardner's uh, diet fit study where they uh, randomized people to a low fat diet or a low carbohydrate diet and the big focus was, was improving diet quality. And then they looked at how much weight they lost, and then they looked at their genotype. And so here you see sort of like the box spots of all the data. Here's how much weight they lost. And it's pretty much the same in all groups, and that's combinations of low-fat diet with a high-fat genotype and vice versa. And basically, it's all entirely the same. So there was no association or no interaction between like these common SNPs that are told to both study whether you should eat more carbs or fat versus how much weight you actually lost in the trial. Um, and they looked and they couldn't find anything um, that, that would result in something positive. So at this point, this is kind of all the data that I showed at AHS in the summer. And I was like, this is great. This is super important. I'm going to write this up as a paper um, and I'm going to submit it to a journal. So this is, the, this, is not, this is the iteration that it's in currently. It's still awaiting peer review, but it's online. So you can go and read it if you're interested. Um, but I sent this to a journal. And the, the editor who read it was, is an academic geneticist. And, and she replied very nicely and said, um, this is nonsense. Um, to everyone in the field, it is clear that one single SNP cannot be used for individual prediction. Like, did anybody in the functional medicine world like, read these papers? Because like, they're still doing that. Um, and then she said, dozens of publications on the uselessness of direct consumer tests in particular and prediction of genetic risk scores already exist. So like, what you're doing is just nonsense. Don't even bother. Um, I'm like, yeah, that's super interesting. Like, I mean, obviously, I mean, I've, I've read a lot of the papers she talked about, but there's a whole swathe of physicians who didn't realize that. Um, and so, like, this is one of the papers that she recommended that I read. It's very good. It's by Eric Koppel and some of his um, some of his collaborators. And this is kind of like the next step of genetic um, testing. So it's a combination of clinical risk plus genetic risk that then may change your threshold for treating something. So here you have clinical risk. You know, this person has high cholesterol. Yeah, we'll worry about that. Um, smoking, and, and, and they have elevated, and, you know, they have hypertension, and they have high polygenic risk. So then, then you might change the threshold for action. Whereas if you have intermediate risk of both, or low risk of both, or intermediate one, higher the other, you won't yet yeah, intervene. So it's where you can identify the higher risk people earlier because you know that their genetics are gonna, are gonna worsen the effect of their lifestyle, their clinical risk. And that kind of starts to make sense. But, you know, let's explore that a little bit. So the one study that looks at this quite nicely was published a few years ago. This looked at 55,000 people, 50 SNPs for risk of coronary disease. And then they looked at the effect of a healthy lifestyle. So you had a healthy lifestyle if you had three out of four of these, no smoking, no obesity, physical activity at least once a week, or a healthy diet pattern. I put that in, in, in quotation marks because it was standard like low fat, no red meat, that kind of stuff. But so like everybody in this room probably ticks these three boxes. So you all have a healthy lifestyle, congratulations. Um, and so like they didn't have a nice graph in the paper, so I just re-plotted it from their data. And here you see the low risk, moderate risk, high risk genotype, and then a low risk, moderate risk, high risk lifestyle. And so, yes, as your genetic risk increases, um, your risk of cardiovascular events increases. Um, and same with lifestyle. But the worst effect is always in people with the, with, the, with the worst lifestyle. So that's none of those. So they were obese, smoke, don't move, and have a bad diet. Um, but the important thing that I think to take away is that everybody benefits, benefited from the lifestyle factors regardless of their genetic risk. So like, you don't need to know somebody's genetic risk to re recommend those things. And knowing their genetic risk doesn't change anything in terms of what you do. And that's the important thing. Like, is it gonna change practice? And no, it's not, because it, you, you have no direct intervention based just on the genotype. So this is, um, you know, if we're thinking about, I think there are some other interesting things that we haven't yet taken into account in terms of whether should, what we should be considering uh, in terms of genetic risk. Um, we still don't understand how all the proteins in a cell interact. There's a paper that came out just last year that basically showed there were several hundred new ways that the proteins that we know about and probably proteins that we don't even know exist yet interact with each other. And these are the things that are affecting your know, actual phenotype. Um, there's also this idea of the omnigenic model of health. So every gene, every protein affects every other gene and protein um, within, you know, within that cell and then you know, 
thousands of potential cell types in the body. Um, and we don't even know all the different types of cells there are in the body. So there was a paper that came out last year that looked at um, 565 epigenetically or transcriptionally distinct cells in the mouse brain. There are 565 different types of cell in the mouse brain. And the mouse brain is much less complex than the human brain. So there's probably thousands of cell types. And then to like do one genetic test and tell me something about the dopamine in my brain, like this doesn't make any sense. We don't even know what we're looking at. Um, then I think what's, oh, you know, when we talk about genetics, I think this is where the problem really starts to come in. So we've already covered how thinking you have a bad gene has a negative effect on your physiology. Um, and then except for one example, being told you have normal genes, has, it has a neutral effect. So you can only be normal or bad, right? You can never be good. Um, and this is how we talk about things. So people talk about MTHFR, they're like, if your MTHFR isn't working properly, you hear that again and again and again. And first of all, the majority of people have an MTHFR that doesn't work properly. And then there's no actual evidence to suggest it's definitely going to have an effect, but we're giving people this automatic nocebo to think that their health is gonna be affected by their genes. And then we're gonna worry that we're not doing what's right for our genetics, but there are almost no studies that say this genotype should have this intervention and you see a benefit because of that interaction. There's very little evidence to support any of that. So what we're doing is we're making people feel bad about their health negatively affecting their physiology with no evidence to support doing that. And so here's an example that I have. This is, um, <laughs> this is uh, from a Formula One driver. There was a company that wanted to give him a genetic test. He did it for free. He was like, this is great. This is gonna help my performance. This is you know, gonna tell me what I should be doing. Here, this is mus muscle fiber type. And here, this is the ACTN3 gene. He has, um, a, he's a homozygote for that. And here's him versus the average, like, here's this big fat red signal. You know, these, this is a problem with your muscles. This is an elite athlete. He, you know, what he thinks about himself, about his performance is gonna be more important than his fitness, you know, when he's driving at a wall at 300 kilometers an hour. And then in this summary, it says, um, your proportion of fast fibers is lower than the general population. Again, this is just from a test, they haven't measured it a low response to strength training. So that work you're doing in the gym isn't gonna work for you because of your genes. Like that you're automatically, you're priming this guy to think less about himself, be less confident, which, and that's exactly what he doesn't need um, when he's driving. And then when you look at the, when you look at this, there are zero references. So like, how do I find out like where they got this from? So I then, I do some digging. Like, so particularly this, you know, this is what I'm worried about. This is what he's worried about. Um, this is ACTN, um, genotype and trainability. So here you see absolute peak power change of people who, who train, you have men, uh, women, here's the genotype. So here's like two uh, homozygotes for the good copy, homozygotes for the bad and in the middle. And you look at this and you go, oh, right. And so men, you know, that's a pretty significant effect. These are standard error of the mean bars. That means huge variability. And this, you know, tiny, it's not even statistically significant, but this is the most cited study for ACTN3 and trainability. Um, and then you think, okay, so how does this compare to my athlete? This is 157 older men and women. And I say older again, because they're only 65, but they were doing four to five sets of 10 leg extensions three times a week, right? <laughs> so again, that's not a bad training protocol, but for a guy who trains like 20 hours a week, like this is just completely irrelevant. Um, so it's not relevant to the elite athlete. And then if I do that same analysis I did earlier, the genius type only explains 6% of the response to training. So again, 94% is all the other stuff that we should be thinking about but you've gone in and you've told this guy that he is gonna respond poorly to training and he will, but only because you told him that he will, not because he, he actually has a genotype that affects that. So then I think it's important to think about how we use this stuff. So um, this is um, a, a nice paper looking at, uh, so this is a polyhazard risk score for Alzheimer's disease or, or age. And here they're looking at predicted age of onset of Alzheimer's disease and so here, um, here, the top 1%, 1% best genetics, basically like 5% per year risk by the time they're 100, right? The Alzheimer's group. Here's like the bottom 1%. Um, and then the gray is the population average. And then these dotted lines are having APOE, uh, at least one copy of APOE4 or not. And you see like there is a meaningful difference here. But the question is, what are you going to do with this information with your patient? Like, are you gonna tell them that they're at increased risk, which is gonna make them worry more, they're gonna have a higher cortisol that's gonna increase their risk of Alzheimer's disease, <laughs> right? 
Um, or are you going to tell them that they're at really low risk and they're going to spend all their time, you know, smoking and not moving? And well, they probably won't get Alzheimer's anyway. But you know, I, like, how is that actually going to affect? Like, what are you going to do with this information? Are you going to increase worry in somebody that's not going to do anything about it? Or are you talking to a person, a very small percentage of the people who will actually be actually actively act on this information? Because when you look overall at the evidence, telling people about their genetics does not change behavior. So all you've done is increased worry and you haven't changed the thing that you're hoping to change, which is what this person is doing. So um, one other thing that I like to think about is that as we, you know, as we evolved, we went from these collectivist cultures where we supported each other, we were part of a group, to the much more individualist society that we um, live in nowadays. And that automatically assumes that we're special, we're different. Um, so I wonder if like doing a 23 and me and like having this affect our physiology just by thinking about it, well, that's an evolutionary mismatch in itself. And I think to, to, to a, a significant extent, extent it really is. Um, so when we're thinking about genetics, this reductionist approach to, to SNPs is really problematic because you don't know, um, uh, if you don't know your phenotype, you don't know, like we can't act on a SNP. We have no, no evidence to support that. If we know the phenotype, we don't know if it was the SNP that caused that or the environment. And for most SNPs, there's no information on how a specific intervention effect interacts with that specific SNP. So we don't even have information that we can use to then give to people uh, based on their genetics. Um, so, you know, if, if we're then going to start to think about this, I think it's really important uh, that you look for evidence of the intervention SNP interaction. Like how much variability is there in the data? Who was studied? Um, is you know the definite evidence that I um, should be recommending something based on this genotype? Um, who were the participants in the study? It's super important. So ethnicity comes up again and again. Um, if you're African American, like regardless of anything, FCO doesn't seem to have an effect. Um, in that uh, SNP lifestyle CBD paper I talked about, all the participants were white. So like. We, but we know that ethnicity has a big, a big factor. We also know socioeconomic status and childhood environment are incredibly important. So all of the studies that look at the effect of different uh, neurotransmitter SNPs and mental health outcomes, they only seem to have penetrance in the setting of uh, childhood abuse. So like most people just don't need to worry about that. But in people who do have that, yes, it potentially becomes important. And then so does like nutrient status, physiolog uh, physiological status. You know, what is this person who, who's being studied? Who is the person in front of me? And do I have evidence that this SNP is important in that type of person? And then I think we, the baseline question should be, what is the likelihood that this SNP will have no overall effect? And in the analyses that we did, uh, basically most SNPs have a less than 10% of the chance of having any effect in the, per in the person in front of them. Um, so as a practitioner, uh, you know, if, if, if you do use SNPs, if you find this stuff interesting, like go and find those papers and do these calculations. It, it's, you, can do, you can randomly generate numbers online. It's super easy. Um, like I used a, like a $100 statistical package to do this. You, know, you can do it free online. You can actually understand this data for yourself and then figure out whether it's meaningful. And then you know, it, it's just worth remembering that genetic-based intervention is really not understood. Um, the disease risk and gene function is dominated by the environment. And then again, always remember who the studies uh, were performed in. Um, then finally, that's it. Thank you to everybody here listening, all my colleagues who let me do all this stuff, even though it technically has nothing to do with my job. Um, thank you uh, so much for listening. And I actually have five minutes, so you can ask me questions if you want. Yeah. I think I started out in 